another night watch and uh, things are a little active. Um, we weren't sure we were transmitting AIS and uh, ships just sort of disappear, they'll appear and disappear. So we're still getting used to all the systems. And uh, it was very strange to me that there weren't that many ships near Puerto Rico. Uh, yesterday I saw a ship disappear right in front of my eyes and uh, it was very strange. And we hadn't seen anything um, the whole time. So maybe I'm just used to the med where there's a lot of vessels and um, there aren't that many, but we did look at the um, vessel tracker when we got online and there are certainly a lot of boats. So we were concerned about what's going on. Anyway, I called a passenger ship that was headed straight for us and they said that they could see us on AIS, which was strange because they were still headed straight for us. But anyway, they veered off course and um, gave us the right away. And um, yeah, so that was a little exciting. The other thing is um, we had a couple warning lights go on our engines. Turns out we, we need the the uh, 250 mile service because we've been doing so much motoring which is just unbelievable and um, but you know they're nanny engines and there's no little cheat sheet that says this is what these things mean um, so we had to track those down so little exciting things um, what else has been going on we had a little squall uh, we took the main down because there's absolutely no wind and there were some squalls. Why not? So there's a small craft advisory. Um, could be a local system. Again, just a couple squalls, but we're just going to barrel through. So the biggest thing on my mind is the fuel still. Um, because of the variations in the gauges, it just, it's gonna be a nail biter because we're gonna go through the Mona Passage with maybe four or five hours to spare on the um, fuel, which is really tight if you ask me. So, um, yeah, <laughs> please say a little prayer. Maybe through the Mona Passage we'll get some wind and we can just sail a little bit. That would be ideal because uh, it will come, we will get some wind from behind so maybe we'll luck out and be able to do that. The problem is it's 10 o'clock at night now and we have about 14 hours to go so what that would mean is that would mean we would need to round the corner and then put up the downwind sail, the A2, in the middle of the night. Um, yeah, fun times. <laughs> so that's what's going on. All together. Welcome to our All Together Passage series, a daily vlog taking you with us on our maiden voyage from France to Miami. We're on leg three to Miami. Good morning, it's um, Sunday, Sunday morning, we're going through the Mona Passage at the moment, which is, uh, has its own stories, but um, on that side we're lucky, we're coming here with uh, pretty flat seas, uh, right there in the background, that's Mona Island, right in the middle of the Mana Passage and there is a little island just uh, called the Thick Monito uh, just north of it so we're going to cross the Mana Passage uh, um, so somewhere there on that side this is Puerto Rico that's the east side on the west side behind the island and that's the Dominican Republic so we're crossing it from um, 
from southeast to northwest. Uh, we're going to stop at the marina called Cap Cana. And the plan is we're expecting to arrive there around um, early afternoon. Do a quick uh, check in, refuel, check out, and um, go on our way to the northern coast of the Dominican Republic. Um, to find cover in a marina called Ocean World and to uh, refuel, favorite pastime. Beautiful sunrise. This is the Mona Passage right now. Absolutely dead calm. I'm one of those people that goes on Google and YouTube when there's a weird area of water and I watch all of the scary footage and there's a lot of scary footage for the Mona Passage and um, we're halfway across it so hopefully I'm not jinxing myself but everything right now is completely opposite of what uh, all the videos are saying. I did the same thing too on the um, Bay of Biscay when we crossed. I kind of freaked myself out about that one um, and talked to like some of the local people and got all scared about it and then we motored across it too. So yeah, it just depends on the weather window for sure. But it's a double-edged sword because it's calm, but we're motoring. So if it were windy, maybe it wouldn't be the same. So, but anyway, oh, the other thing is the humpback whales are supposed to be through here, going through here and migrating. And uh, yeah, so we'll keep our eye out for humpback whales. There's supposed to be whales. Did you know that? I heard about it. Yeah. No sprays that I've seen. I know, let's keep our eyes peeled. Maybe there's a season. So. This is the season. It is? Yeah, yeah. Well, How's your morning going? Um, Who's yeah. that? Went shot three hours ago, so they're probably here. Oh, there's wow. About 80 nautical mile difference. Not much. Neck and neck. But um, that vertical difference plus our pit stop to refuel make it like. And we are like uh, behind probably 12 hours and that will make the difference between them um, making it to Turk and Caicos as the wind starts to build but protected on the northern side um, by the island for us um, to leave after we refuel uh, it's not going to cut it and there is no escaping once you go so they're looking good. You would have had a little bit of wind the whole passage and go much faster than motoring. Or if we would have left a uh, yeah, 12 hour difference, it would be a whole different ball game. But now I'm sticking to our plan, I guess. So this is what the fuel gauges say on the inside. I don't know if you can see that. So they're both saying 12%, about 30 liters. So the gauges on the fuel tanks say 12%, but the line is here, the blue line. So according to the blue line, that's more than 12%, but we don't actually know the shape of the tank in the back. So I'm gonna try to look. back behind here the tanks look to be flat and square so I don't know if the camera picks that up or not you can see 
back there. So, I don't know, we should be okay. Nothing like uh, rooting around where the trash is. I start my day. Um, but you just saw what I recorded on the tanks was definitely more than 10%. So we'll see. I wish I knew exactly. Uh, we need to figure out a way to really determine not only how much fuel we have, but how much we're burning per hour at what RPM. We have the theoretical from Nanny, which was eight. Um, but I did some calculations based on us leaving just south of Puerto Rico so far and it looked like 10 so that's uh, something we're gonna have to sort out this is the great thing about boats is you learn something new every day very practical information that you need to have and um, you don't know what information you need until you actually need it but it's good it's good it keeps us on our toes we're learning something new and you know, as we age, it's good to exercise different parts of our brain, I think. So, I think that's why we do this. Stay sharp, stay healthy and active. You know, have good adventures. And uh, the secret with adventures is you just never know what's going to happen. If you knew what was going to happen, it wouldn't be an adventure. So, this is certainly an adventure. We don't know how the story is going to turn out. Okay, so we're about an hour and 15 minutes away, and... From Miami? No. <laughs> and theoretically, we only need about 15 liters of fuel, and we theoretically have 50 liters, so... So then, Puerto Rico... Dominican Republic, the Mona Passage, so we do a pit stop right here, and then we're going to go to this uh, first red mark, Ocean World, and um, yeah, find shelter. Unfortunately, we could potentially move further west, but the only other place further west for us is this one. It's only 13 nautical miles away, but it's uh, mooring balls and anchoring and p potentially yeah. So what do you gain in the day, later in the day at, at night? And we're too late to try to make it to Turks and Caicos, which would have been the preferred option where the um, sun umbrella is. Oh, look, it's a cute little umbrella. Yeah, so that was the dream uh, yeah. spot. Uh, Moonshot is like going to Ultramar 55, he's headed that way. And uh, so it's on the pink boat? Uh, pink line, yeah. So I did a routing for them. We are, we are way behind. I mean, it doesn't look like we are. Whoops, sorry. It doesn't look like we're that far, um, but they have, uh, by the time, by the time we stop, uh, we have like at least probably now 90 or nautical miles. And by the time we stop and they res and restart, they'll be like further away for us. That's just a long way. The, the bad weather is coming. And the challenge is you have to enter from the Northwest part. The northwest part, you have this narrow, narrow passage right there, pretty shallow waters, but that will be okay, normal weather, except the waves initially are going to come this way and the wind, but then it's going to rotate. So if you get there, by the time the waves are like southwest or west, and you have like basically breaking waves to enter the channel, and you have to time it perfectly yeah, to enter during daylight. It's not a good situation. So, and then you have no backup. If yeah. you're here and it's breaking here. What do you uh, do? You, yeah. yeah. So we're too late to make this attempt. I hope the other backup we looked at was, um, uh, it's called... Uh, Grand Turk. Grand Turk, yeah. To try to enter through this super narrow channel and anchor in there. But one, we again, we will have to arrive during the day based on our routing. We will arrive at 
dawn or at night so we could not get it through and then you have to hope it's not very deep and not very big so you have to hope like there is not already no like boats. 100 boats uh, yeah anchoring in there because now you're like screwed and then when you need to leave um yeah the waves will be pretty bad and and that's probably going to be a passage that might be uh, difficult so yeah. to kind of stop in the dominican republic not the best stop the best stop for us right now but the, not the best place to restart from because we'll get westerly winds we'll get the westerly waves that have been blowing from from far away for the couple days so to restart it'll be wind and waves in the nose eventually the wind will rotate from west to uh, northwest and to north um, so that's going to create some confused seas um, so we'll see when our restart time is but um, yeah and it's, that's still 650 nautical miles away from Miami so we're just getting all the lines ready getting the trash out um, reattaching the halyards so they're not clipped to the forward cleats because we'll need those for dock lines we're preparing the dock lines We've uh, pumped up the fenders. Daniel's on the lookout for fishing pots and whales. And uh, Stefan is prepping our little experiment to try to determine the levels on the tanks when we fill them up. So we have a really high tech system with duct tape because duct tape is the thing that solves everything. We're going to tape a line on the tank and when we fill up the tanks, we're gonna note how many liters we put in and then do the math backwards. So you can see right now, it looks as if we have at least 25% on our tanks but the gauge on the inside says 12%. So we're gonna do it by liters. Yeah, so this is the point, is that it looks like we have fuel in the tank still, but because the intake valve for the fuel that transfers the fuel from the tank to the engine isn't at the bottom of the tank, because at the bottom of the tank it, you know stuff settles and you don't want to be sending that to your engine so the intake valve for the fuel is above that so your tanks will look like you have fuel even though you can't actually use the fuel so while the tank says it's a 275 liter tank so it's it's not really clear how much of the fuel in the bottom of the tank isn't usable fuel so even though it says we have fuel we don't actually have fuel. Uh, so this is gonna help us a little bit at least know how much fuel we're putting in. And we can assume what we have now is zero, zero fuel. So even though it says 12%, that gives us a little bit of a cushion. We're told by Utremer that at 0% on the sea zone, um, there's still fuel going to the engine, but we don't know anything below that. Like we have no idea what's below that or, or how many um, liters are left between zero and, and the bottom of the intake line. So that's the situation. So we made it to Cape Canna, and we're sitting here waiting to get fuel. Whew, what a relief. Uh, the whole fuel counting situation was quite stressful. So how it works here is you go in to get the fuel and then the immigration people board your boat and you check in and you check out at the same time. Uh, they also may inspect your boat. We're just waiting because there's a boat there already. Nice little marina. Narrow channel. Yeah, because we're moving with the wind. So we, we feel like more current wind. One step closer. It was like a part one of leg one because we stopped to refuel. Uh, we accounted two hours. It took two hours between uh, waiting for the fuel dock and um, waiting another hour to get the paperwork done. And so we have another 24 hours ish to 
get to uh, Puerto Plata, the Ocean World Marina, where we will weather the storm. Are you waiting for this guy to come in? Or? Yeah. Um, so that's a wrap for Cap Kuna. And now we're on our way to Ocean World. And uh, that'll be more of what we'll talk to you about tomorrow.